Mijuxis, everyone. Welcome to First Foods. This is Feeding Motherhood, Teas, Tinctures, and Bone Broth. My name is Desiree Kane. I'm a Miwok Two-Spirit that lives here on occupied Arapaho territory. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is, well, good afternoon, rather. This is Brooke, um, your host for First Foods. I'm also the program director and welcoming everybody back and just thanking everybody from coming back again. We have these now again, um, as stated before, moving from Thursdays to Wednesdays. So we will be here every Wednesday um, moving forward. But just thanking everybody for coming and thanking Phoenix, our teacher for tonight. And um, yeah, so let's get into some protocols as we usually do. Okay, so land acknowledgement. We recognize, uphold, and respect Native nations in their life ways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island and Abiyala. Everyone attending the space must uphold the same. Native knowledge. Lessons learned are not for non-natives to monetize on or repackage as their own. Native knowledge systems belong to the cultural communities they come from and to the guest teachers in our programming. Remember that we are all from different nations and regions. So what may be odd or undesirable as food to you might be good to someone else. Respect that. And don't insult or belittle. Respect tribal food, land, and medicine sovereignty. Remember that the majority of foods are shared by many different tribes, but with different names. Do not try to claim exclusivity, copyright for your own people. It's okay to share the name you know as it is. It is, a, it is not okay to cause dissent over a different name. No dissent over blood quantum or otherwise more Indianer than you fighting. Foraging and harvesting. Always seek permission to our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the support to continue to make First Foods happen. With our switch to Wednesdays, we also are going to continue our programming with their support all the way until the end of the year. So we've got good classes lined up for everybody, and um, a really wonderful instructor is coming back to visit with us and to teach us more things. Um, I'm going to leave it to Phoenix to introduce herself and to tell us what we're going to learn today. But I promise you, it is going to be so interesting and definitely a first foods first. So I will turn it over to Phoenix for today's class. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Phoenix Anaya. I am a White Mountain and Mescalero Apache. And my class today will be called uh, Feeding Indigenous Motherhood, uh, Teas, Tinctures, and Bone Broth. So um, by the end of this class, I hope that everybody in the class will be able to understand um, certain natural medical terms, um, medical words associated with pregnancy and lactation, and um, understand the benefits of bone broth and stews. And to be honest, I was going to have a list prepared um, for a list of herbs um, and their precautions, but I can I can make that available later. Sorry. Um, so while they're doing that, I just want to talk about the first part, and that's um, allopathy. Allopathy is what we call modern standard medicine. That's the that's the normal normal medicine that you see in the regular hospitals. You know regular nurses and doctors with their stethoscopes and whatnot. Um, modern standard medicine focuses on treating symptoms and diseases using drugs, uh, radiation, uh, surgery, and like other, other things like that. Um, it's great for acute issues and emergencies. So an acute issue is something that suddenly happens, like, like when you have a sudden influenza or um, if you break your arm, those are considered acute or, or emergent situations. And modern medicine is great for that because it, it works very quickly. Oh, okay. Turn the page. Okay, so this is allopathy, back. <laughs> allopathy, what I was talking about. Um, 
you may, if after modern standard medicine has, um, has pharmaceuticals that tend to um, have a lot of side effects and the chemicals, the chemical processes that they use to make these pharmaceuticals um, make, you know, build up in your body, have side effects and whatnot. Um, so you may have to detox after taking um, regular treatment. And modern standard medicine focuses on treating your symptoms over the actual disease. And it focuses on alleviating symptoms. So when you get sick, um, most of the time they look at, okay, you're having, you know, you have a stuffed nose, you have a lot of swelling going on, we're going to give you some anti-inflammatories for that. Well, that's great and all, but what made me sick in the first place? Um, um, so naturopathy or alternative medicine, also called alternative medicine, it's medicine that combines traditional medicine and that traditional medicine can, can vary according to your region or the type of natural medicine that you focus on, such as um, modern Western herbalism. And they call this thing, uh, there, there's a type of herbalism they call planetary herbalism, but that's actually more like international herbalism because they, they combine all of the herbal knowledge from around the world and use it. While modern Western herbalism kind of focuses on the, on the herbs and stuff that are more prevalent um, in the West and like in Europe or in North America. Um, traditional medicine from your respective ethnic group, that's, that's also considered alternative or natural medicine. Um, modern diagnostic technology is used in naturopathic medicine in order to help diagnose you. So for example, uh, before going to a rolfing session, you know, you can get an MRI and the MRI will show them, okay, this is what's going on inside of the spine. So it'll help, it'll help the practitioner know exactly how to treat something. Um, the focus in naturopathic medicine is not on treating the symptoms itself, but by treating a cause of a symptom. So when you're, when you're receiving treatment from a, tr from traditional or, or natural medicine, um, your symptoms may not be focused on, um, so much. So if you have, you know, if you have diarrhea or something, uh, and they figure out, all oh, right, um, you're gonna get, we're gonna give you these herbs to treat it because you're getting your diarrhea from stress. So we're gonna have, we're gonna give you herbs to treat your stress. You know, your diarrhea might not really alleviate because they're treating your stress. So once your stress is treated, then then the symptom will go away, the diarrhea will go away. And um, so that's how they they focus on treating a cause versus the symptom, unless a symptom is is very intolerable then then obviously you can you can be given something to treat you know to help with it um yeah uh, naturopathy uses a variety of treatment approaches the most important one would be a diet and lifestyle change uh stress reduction and then um stress reduction and, and use of like psychotherapy and counseling um, psychotherapy and counseling, counseling, it could be, it could be seeking a, a matriarch or somebody trusted in your community and somebody knowledgeable that you can talk to and, and try to process what's going on with you. Um, it uses natural medicines and supplements, supplements such as vitamins or, or powdered capsules of, of herbs. Um, physical therapies such as massage or, you know, actually manipulating your joints and your body around. Exercise therapy, they might even prescribe you, hey, you're going to have to go running every morning. Um, and that's part of your, that's part of your treatment. Um, guided detoxification, that's when people, that's when the practitioner prescribes for you a medicinal diet to, to detox from maybe something building up in you. Uh, and more, and it's best used for non-acute conditions such as chronic or chronic is long-term or conditions or or mild conditions. So now we're going to look at some pregnancy terms, and um, the first three that I want to talk about has to do with your uterus. 
So a uterine stimulant is something that stimulates contractions um, and it can be used also not when you're not pregnant, if you want to, um, if you want to stimulate like a period or if your period is too light and it is actually worrying you, you could take a uterine stimulant to, to help, you know, push out something. But when you're pregnant, you actually want to avoid them because uterine stimulants, as it says, it causes contractions. So you could miscarry from them. Um, things such as uh, blue cohosh, motherwort, uh, golden seal, yarrow and wormwood these things um these these plants they they stimulate contractions and with that is an amenagogue so the third one there amenagogue is something that stimulates uterine bleeding and the shedding of the uterine lining now an amenagogue does not necessarily cause a contraction so um if for example if you was to drink um motherwort Motherwort can stimulate bleeding in a lower dose, but it, it, it can be an amenagogic, but it might not be a uterine stimulant. Now, if you up the dosage, it could stimulate the contractions and there it will go from just being an amenagogue into being a uterine stimulant as well. But um, so anything that, would, that stimulates uterine contractions, it will also stimulate bleeding. Um, antispasmodic, that's the opposite of a uterine stimulant because it calms down uterine contractions. So black cohosh can be used for that or white dead nettle. And there's other, other calming plants, but those are the, the two I'm gonna mention here. Okay, so a uterine toner, um, you know, it, it prepares the uterus for birth by strengthening the uterine muscles for the contractions. So um, that's important because during birth, um, the, the uterine muscles have to compress your blood vessels to reduce your blood flow and increase your coagulation to prevent hemorrhage or blood loss. A hemorrhage is like, uh, what, 500, like about 500 milliliters of blood or more. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's hemorrhage. Um, lack of uterus tone or muscle strength is called um, uterine atony, and it can lead to life-threatening hemorrhage. So certain, certain, there are certain um, herbs that, uh, that you can take toward the ends of, their, of the pregnancy in small amounts, such as black cohosh or raspberry leaf, blue cohosh or red clover. Um, if you take those ones taken in mild like teas or in, in uh, small tincture doses, um, toward, I want to say the last two week or two of pregnancy, it'll strengthen the uterus muscles and, and lower the risk of, of blood loss. A uterine astringent or a hemostatic is a, is a thing that it dries out the tissue or it vasoconstricts or shrinks your blood vessels. And usually you can tell if something is astringent if you put it on your skin and then you feel your skin kind of dry up and get tight. Or, or kind of feel like your skin is like shrinking, um, then that's a astringent. So something such as uh, witch hazel, witch hazel bark, um, it's astringent, it's very astringent. If you ever use witch hazel on your face and then you felt your, your skin kind of shrink and get kind of tight and then it dries up the skin, yeah, it's being astringent. Um, it's good for stopping menorrhagia, which is inexplicable or unstoppable menses blood or stress-induced bleeding during pregnancy, such as spotting. So if you have inex unexplained spotting and there's no reasoning for it, you know, the doctor can, your, your regular allopathic doctor can prescribe you some medication for it. Um, or you could um, seek the use of, of mild astringents to dry that up. But of course you would have to, you know, get your, Get your primary your your physician's advice for that. Um, let's see, white dead nettle or witch hazel. Those are those are two good ones for helping to stop stop heavy bleeding um, or spotting. Um, hyperemesis. Now this is severe. Um, what's it, what's that disease? That, not disease. It's the thing you get when you're when you're pregnant. Morning sickness. <laughs> the severe morning sickness. Uh, it's vomiting, nausea. Um, you have to avoid purgative things. Purgative things are things that make you um, purge, like vomit or, or diarrhea, kick out things from your body. 
So things such as uh, corn silk or ginger or lemon balm, uh, chamomile, mint. If it if you have if it's digestion related hyperemesis, then you could take some like slippery elm capsules um, to help with that. Now we've got some postpartum terms to look at this time. And the first one is uh, lactation. Lactation is when your mammary glands are creating milk. And letdown is when your milk is actually released from the breast in response to nursing or touch stimuli. And letdown stimulates uterine action. So when you're pregnant, you should be careful of things Unless you're toward the end of your pregnancy, you should be careful of things that would um, either purgatives or, or, or stimulate milk letdown because it can stimulate the contractions. It releases oxytocin and oxytocin um, stimulates contractions. Uh, so things such as um, fennel, fenugreek, manual hand stimulation, uh, borage and black seed, these sorts of things stimulate letdown. And uh, they're also lac lactation uh, stimulants. Um, I said fenugreek, goat's through, goat's through a milk thistle, raspberry leaf and vervain, they can stimulate it. Sage can actually dry up your milk. So um, I actually, to be honest, I've, I've drank, I've drunk uh, sage when I was breastfeeding and it didn't dry up my milk. And I think that maybe it's because I only drank like one cup in the day. Um, so maybe maybe that that one might depend on on per on you know per person. Also, what else is a lactation stimulant? Is a uh, cress cress seeds. They're very good uh, at stimulating milk and regulating hormones as well. Uh, mastitis. Mastitis is a condition when your breast tissues become very inflamed and often infected. Now, this is something that happens to a lot of a lot of mothers. Um, you know, when they're breastfeeding, um, if 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 it gets infected, a lot of reasons could could lead up to that. For example, cracks in the nipples could let in some pathogens, um, and the pathogens, the bacteria or whatnot, they can come from even sweating. Because, you know, if you're wearing, if it's hot outside and you're going to be outside for a while and you're breastfeeding and there's cracks in your nipples, um, if it's hot and you're sweaty, I mean, it can breed some bacteria there, which can get inside the tissue and, and cause an infection. Also, um, engorgement, when you're, when the milk fills up the breasts, like all the way in and, and it's not released, engorgement leads to mastitis. It leads to heavy swelling and, and whatnot. Um, it can also happen um, when you're weaning a child because you know the milk buildup or during postpartum depression. So basically, whenever a person is not um, not expressing the milk and it and it becomes engorged, it can all it can all lead to mastitis. So good ways to, to treat that could be um, calendula creams. Calendula is a pot marigolds, marigold orange flowers, making creams from that or, or drinking it. Uh, common plantain, it's also, um, it's also called white man's foot. Um, common plantain poultices can be, can be applied and help or cabbage leaves, you know, steamed or, or blanched cabbage leaves put in the, in the bra. Okay, this one is um, postpartum depression. Postpartum depression um, can, can happen after giving birth. There is a type of depression that, by the way, that can uh, uh, happen you know, before giving birth when you're actually pregnant. Um, and basically they kind of, there's a, there's a lot of factors that can go into it you know, personal fears about, about having a child, like if it's your, your first child, you know, just having fears about having the child and how you're gonna raise it and, and you know, disappointment in yourself because, you know, if you, if you think, oh, I thought things were gonna be, you know, more stable or better when I finally had a kid, you know? You know, those kinds of, those kinds of negative thinking can, can lead to postpartum depression. 
your hormones because the sudden hormone changes can also lead to lead to the depression or intense depression um combination of your current current stresses or ongoing ptsd from traumatizing life events a lot of these things can can come together to really you know cause a depression so for that uh, the best thing to look at is is to have a support system. You know, talk to your family, talk to talk to your friends, talk to to wise people that you can trust and help you process these things. Talk to you know grandmothers and other mothers, and you know ask them how they did it. You know, it's just very important to have a, a good support system. And something you can do um, to help with to help cope with depression is uh, to drink St. John's wort in a tea. Uh, not a strong one. You can have it in a, a mild tea because it does, it can be passed through breast milk. Um, so, and you know, when it comes to breast milk, I mean, even your child will, will get it too. I mean, St. John's wort, um, it's an antidepressant kind of um, medication, kind of, kind of plant. So I would just suggest having a, a very homeopathic dose of it, you know? Now we're gonna talk about nutrition. Nutrition, so feeding the spirit and the body. When you're pregnant and also after you give birth, extra nutrition is needed um, during the different phases of pregnancy to ensure that your child has enough building blocks for creation. Um, the way I was taught was that, um, you know, women, women have creation energy going on, you know, when you, especially like when you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding because you're, you're actively creating like another human being. Um, so you have to really make sure that, that you feed yourself properly to, to create that child. Um, and you're, you're also, how do I say that? That creation energy, it's like it needs, it needs something. The way I was taught anyway, that, that creation energy, you need to feed it, it needs a fuel. So you need to eat very healthy, eat a lot of vegetables, eat a, um, and you know, just, just be careful of how much you're, you're taking in of, of bad things because um, you know, they need, children need extra calcium, iron, folate, selenium, all of these things. So you got to get that from a lot of vegetables and leafy green, uh, leafy green plants. Uh, you take your prenatal vitamins and omega-3s. Also, when you get, when you give birth, when you're breastfeeding, you should also take these vitamins because you're trying to, you're trying to pass the nutrition through your milk. Um, bone stews and broths of when you're pregnant and after you give birth, they provide um, they provide needed collagen, uh, chondroitin, glucosamine, amino acids. All of these things come from the connective tissues that are melted down from the, from the, the stewing process. Obviously, the bone leaches out calcium and phosphorus and other minerals, and fish bones provide iodine for thyroid function. Um, anyway. Okay. I want to add in here that you need to consult with your knowledge holders, your grandmothers, the other mothers, your medicine people to know what things specifically will be recommended for you and your child uh, according to your people um, when it comes to creating the next generation of humans, when it comes to being pregnant and, and breastfeeding. Because I know that there are often things that you have to stay away from um, according to your traditions and your teachings for your respective tribes. Um, uh, there's things that you have to eat and there's things you should stay away from eating when you're pregnant or breastfeeding. And there will also be stories for why and for how. Um, so I, you really have to check in with these people just to, to get, get proper guidance for you according to your people um, on, on, on how, how to how to make the next human according to, you know, with their, how to create the, your next human spiritual connection and physical connection with your people before your child comes out. 
Um, and there's there's also rules uh, depending like wh when you're pregnant on what things you can eat in season according to the time you're 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 in. Like I don't know if you're not allowed to eat certain certain fish or certain certain berries, you know, in the in the fall and you're pregnant in the fall, but those things are also supposed to be good when you're pregnant, but you can't have it in the fall. You gotta make sure that you, you ask the appropriate people to make sure, okay, I know I'm supposed to eat this when I'm pregnant, but it's the fall, you know what I mean? Um, and all of these things will strengthen your spirit, your connection with the earth, and also start your unborn child's connections, you know? And there's uh, interesting, kind of uh, knowledge I wanna, I wanna talk about real quick. <laughs> and that is when it comes to creating a, a girl child, your, a daughter. So your daughter, when you're pregnant with, with a daughter, your daughter's eggs are actually created in utero, in your stomach. So technically you as a mother, you're making your daughter and at the same time, you're making the basis for your grandchildren at the same time. So it's like, technically, it's like, like the mother is starting your child's connection, as well as your unborn grandchildren's connections. And by eating, eating properly, eating, eating healthily, both medically as well as spiritually, according to your people, it will, it will help to ensure good initial physical and spiritual health, not just for the one generation, but for two generations, your daughter and her children already. I thought that was cool. Okay, now we're gonna talk about herbal preparations real quick. So the first one is called an alcoholic tincture. A tincture is, it's like, I wanna say it's like a, like a cold made tea, but with the alcoholic, uh, liquid. So it's usually made with a, with a pure clear alcohol, such as vodka, that's a popular thing to make it with. And it's made by soaking dry or fresh herb for two to four weeks minimum in alcohol and water, which is then strained through a jelly bag or a folded cheesecloth or, or even a wine press. I like the wine press, it's, it's faster. Um, usually uh, you would use about one kilo of herb to about five liters of liquid. And the, an ex, the example for the liquid, and you can scale this up to get the right amount, would be about three fourth liter of vodka and about 375 milliliters of water. That's how you, you cut that down. And make sure you do not use methyl or isopropyl alcohols because those are, those are industrial alcohols for cleaning and they're highly toxic. Um, non-alcoholic tinctures, that's the second one. And non-alcoholic tinctures are good for people who want to avoid alcohol or if they don't want to give, because when you serve a tincture, you're going to give it in drops. Like literally a dosage could be two drops or five drops, but still some people are worried about even taking two drops of alcohol. So they could go for a non-alcoholic tincture. So this is popular for children and for pregnant women or, or people who are abstaining from alcohol for whatever personal reason they have. Um, and that is usually made by one part of food grade glycerin to three parts of water and to measure a part. So basically, for example, let me take my coffee cup. Um, if you have like one coffee cup, right? And you fill it up with glycerin, that's this coffee cup, we're gonna consider it one part. Uh, so then uh, three parts would be three of these cups. So um, if I have one cup of, of glycerin, I dump it into the little jar and then three, three cups of the same size of water. That's one part to three parts. Uh, so again, it's one part food grade glycerin to three parts of water, you mix it up and the best water would be distilled water. Um, if you don't have distilled water, I would say bottled water or if you don't have that, boil it and strain your, strain your water and, and should at least it's better than nothing. So you fill half a container with the dried herb, or if you're using fresh herb, then it would be two thirds of the container with fresh herb. And then you cover all of this with your glycerin and water mix. And 
with both the alcoholic and non-alcoholic tinctures, you basically succuss them, you, you shake them every day, at once, once in the day, every day for the two to four weeks minimum. And so there's some people who think that tinctures uh, get stronger um, when you soak them. Uh, so, I mean, there's some people who will, will soak them for like six weeks. It's up to you. But if it does, I, I feel like it gets stronger that way. So I would say instead of, if a dose called for six drops, I would probably give three or five. No, yeah, three or four. And so the next one would be tisanes, or they're also called commonly called teas or also called infusions. So a tea is usually made with the aerial parts and the flowers, the, the tender parts of the plant basically. And an average serving, if you're gonna make like, if a, if a serving is gonna be like two cups or three cups in a day, you would use about 25 grams of dried herb to half a liter of water. And if you were using fresh herbs, you would just triple the quantity. So instead of 25 grams of dried herb, it would be about 75 grams. Um, and what, how to make that is you would boil water. As soon as the water is boiled, remove it from the heat. And then you pour that into your herb mixture. Let it sit for about up to 10 minutes, you know, and then you strain it and you can put it in a bottle. You can drink it warm or you can drink it cool as you like. And it's usually, Usual doses would be one cup in the morning, one cup in the evening, or you could do one cup a day. Uh, that's usual doses for, uh, for things such as, such as, you know, preparing for labor or toning your uterus or, you know, trying to, trying to stop spotting or, or if you have, you know, some people get constipated and then it leads to hemorrhoids when they're pregnant. So like, for example, having a Senna tea, you know, drinking two cups of that, one in the morning, one at night, or just one in the day, it will, it can help alleviate it. So that's how you would use it to say. Now a decoction, a decoction is basically a tea and it's, and it's, um, it's for the hard parts, such the, the more dense parts of a plant, such as roots, barks, berry, the woody parts. And usually it's, um, about 25 grams of dried herb to about three fourths liter of water. And the way you do that is you would put it in a pot or a double boiler, whichever you want. And then you put it on low heat. And then while on low heat, you let it, you let it heat up and kind of simmer for maybe 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes max. And then you turn it off, you can strain it, and again, you can save your save your save your drink for when you for when you're going to take your dose. So decoctions are good for like black cohosh because you use the roots for the cohosh plant. Okay, next one. In these slides, I'm going to show you some pictures of some some plants that I mentioned. So raspberry leaf and red clover, they're good uh, uterine toners. They're good for recovering after you know, after giving birth, you know. Um, so on the left, you have dried raspberry leaf and fresh raspberry leaf into a tea. And then that's, a, that's what red clover looks like. And it doesn't look too much different when it's, when it's dried either, um, the red clover anyway. Now on the next page, I'm showing you some fenugreek. And fenugreek um, is used to stimulate milk, to let down. Um, and that one, I would say, start using it toward the ends of your pregnancy because it stimulates milk, milk production. Then you have blue cohosh root, and that one should be avoided unless you're at the ends of your pregnancy because it's, because it, it stimulates uterine action. Uh, and then senna, senna leaf at the bottom, um, the leaf is stronger than the pod. A lot of people prefer the pod because they feel like, uh, like it's milder. I like the leaf, but anyway, that's senna leaf. And what it does is it's a purgative. It's, um, it's a bowel purgative. Um, so it will simulate diarrhea or loose, loose stools. And that's great when you're pregnant because a lot of, like I said, a lot of pregnant women um, 
they end up getting hemorrhoids and stuff because you know they get constipation and, and whatnot when they're pregnant. And Senna can can really help move your bowels along, you know. But see, di you know, having diarrhea or basically a stimulated bowel, I should say, um, it causes it's it does stimulate um, labor, especially when you start going if you know, for the mothers out there who know, when you're, when you're in labor, um, or, you know, the, the last week of your pregnancy before you give birth, you know, one of the signs of labor is often diarrhea or loose stools. And so what happens with that is when your body starts having that diarrhea, it does stimulate uh, your, your uterus to start contracting. So um, Senna can, can, can you know cause the same thing because it is stimulating the the loose stools the loose bowels so that's why i would only take this in the um in very mild doses when you're pregnant like maybe a cup a day with like one one teaspoon or two teaspoons of leaves to a cup of hot water and that's it um and then after you give birth, if you had a C-section, Sen is your best friend. Because <laughs> when you have a C-section, you just you just want to use the bathroom without feeling like you're going to die. <laughs> so Sen is your best friend for that. And that concludes my PowerPoint. I'm about to take you in my kitchen now and um, show you what I'm doing there with my, my sheep head. <laughs> well, I'm going to say just one thing, Phoenix. So when you have vaginal birth, it's going to be your best friend too, because a lot of the times the pressure um mm -hmm. i mean some some babies are like 10 pounds right even if they're seven pounds that pressure can put pressure on the anus and you will get hemorrhoids also so that'll yeah, be your best I, friend I even in a that. vaginal birth yeah i did mention that about you know when you're just you know in general before you give birth sorry i'm putting my hair up real quick because i'm about to go to the kitchen and it's hot in there <sighs> I can't wait for this. This is about to get real. You're putting your hair up. Yep, she's gonna throw down in the kitchen. <laughs> um, am I on your internet or am I on the, which, because because I need to know because I'm about to go in the kitchen. All right, give me a second. The house. Oh, you're muted, this. Oh. There we go. I don't know about you, Brooke. I have been like taking feverish notes. That was so helpful. Like, I don't know. I just got information overload and it just feels so good, you know, to, I like to study and this class is really good for that. Yeah, definitely. I think too, having kind of like introductory herbal classes like this are important because a lot of times mothers are left out of a lot of conversations Mm -hmm. um, in programming, in radical spaces, even in community uh, spaces, there's lots of mothers who Hello? Um, Can you guys hear they me? don't have connection there. So it's important. Mm -hmm. I think these things are cool. You're here, Phoenix? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Which well, we one is the... You. All right, I'm going to my kitchen right now. Sorry about that. It's, uh, you know, trying to figure out the Wi-Fi situation. You know. <laughs> well, it'll be okay. interesting to do some things like these uh, kind of um, more functional classes for folks who maybe we haven't really announced it, but we will. We're doing some discussion rooms on Facebook. So if folks want to do plant show and tell, which is what I, I want to see other people's gardens and see what you're growing and like See all the weird, I want to see your plant babies and I want to share my plant babies with you. Um, so we have a bunch of different ones scheduled, but it looks like Phoenix is back up and running. So we'll go back to her and we'll talk about those rooms for our class. Okay, can you guys um, see what I'm cooking over here? Yes, but can you turn your camera the other way? Wait, wait, sideways? Yes, please. There it is. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, wow. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so this is what I'm, I, I, I washed it already, and I, I actually used a disposable straight razor to uh, clean off these, uh, these bones. So I got feet, and I got 
a head and I, I chose to have it cut in half because it'll cook faster. So this is a sheep head and these are the, the feet. So I use the straight razor. Well, first off, I um, I shaved them. I burn I burn the hair off and then I shave it. And then I wash it and then I blanch it in boiling water and to make it easier to shave off the hair. Then I take the straight razor and I shave it off. And then I pre-boil it uh, twice and drain it. So this is what it looks like, you know, when you pre-boil it twice. And the reason why I pre-boil it is because I'm kind of girly, okay? I don't like the the strong gamey taste, you know? <laughs> so I pre-boil it twice to help alleviate that flavor. Um, but I still have a good, decent amount of marrow inside. And that's what it's gonna look like. So once once I did that, oh, I boiled it in a little bit of in, in salt and vinegar. And that's what I, that's what I boiled it in twice. So I'm gonna show you some things you can, can use for it. So this is a dried lemon. It's a, it's a sun-dried lemon. I don't know if you guys ever done this in your house, but especially in the desert, once we, once we got lemons, we just, you know, we're gonna preserve it. You know, this, you know, we, we can't, especially historically, we didn't really have refrigerators. So we just dried everything. So if you ever have lemons or limes, I think this is a lime, yeah, it's a lime, um, that are going very dry, just let them dry all the way. And I will just break it like this. I'm not gonna break it all the way, but I just kind of crack it open so that water can get into it. Now, and the other thing I could use is, this is um, lemon salt. What's a lemon salt? Citric acid, this is citric acid. Or you can use white vinegar. And what that does is it helps the, the calcium and whatnot the nutrition from the bones leach into the water, which is really what you're you're trying to aim for. So this time around, like I like I said, I I parboiled them, and um, I'm gonna put an onion in it, and I got some extra stuff I dry in my house. So that's the garlic that I dry. I got some black pepper, some some cilantro seed, you know, coriander seed. Um, some some cumin and a bay leaf. Now you could get fancy with it, and and um, like if you're breastfeeding, you can put some fenugreek seed or fenugreek leaves, and that'll uh, it'll help with letdown. Oh wait, I also put some fennel seed in it. I don't know if you can see that. So basically, what I would do with this is I'll just dump it inside. If you like chili peppers, now some people. Some people get contractions from chili peppers. So, I mean, if you're one of those people that that can't do spicy, can't do chili, then then don't do it. If you're, you know, if you're pregnant and you, you don't want to give yourself contractions. Um, so I'll put the onions in it. I already cracked the lemon, the sun-dried lemon, so I'm just gonna stick it in. I think it tastes better than putting citric acid or vinegar anyway. And then after that, I'm gonna use my water filter and fill it up with water. That's basically it. I'm gonna fill it up with water. I'm gonna throw a handful of salt in it and I'm gonna let it boil for about four hours, four to six hours minimum. Um, and just keep topping it up with water until it's, until it's done. So this is a basic bone broth with uh, with hooves in the head. <laughs> you can use chicken, you can use fish, fish bones if you want a fishy soup. So this is a finished example. Oh, let me get my spoon. So this is a finished example of a broth. I actually had removed the, the head from this one, but I didn't deflesh the, the 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 feet. So this is what the feet look like after it's been boiled. And this the soup, um, because of the the connective tissue melting down, this will actually gelatinize um, if it when it gets cold. And that's that's basically it. Simple bone broth.
And the reason why I cut the sheep head in half was so that it cooks faster. Um, you know, if I if I left it whole, I just stick that thing in a pressure cooker. It'll take too long. But it is kind of cool when you serve the sheep head, you know, and it's whole and you don't cut it in half, because then you can just like take it out and then like spread the jaws open and then you know rip it in half. But you know, hey, I mean, I like it like that. You might not. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, uh, any questions? I I have one. Okay. What are some of the health benefits of a bone broth, right? So I've never had a child, but would like to sometime, maybe if I'm blessed with one, you know, uh, why would I drink a bone broth besides just like, it looks a little wild, but that also, I, th I think it's probably delicious. Like I'm listening to the things that you put in. Do you just drink it like as a health aid or like, why would you drink a sheep's head? I'm sorry if that question um, here. I just don't, I don't know. It is healthy because you do have, um, sorry, I just read the, the thingy that came up the front. Um, <laughs> one Distracted, I'm like a squirrel. Um, <laughs> it is healthy because the, from the bones, like I said earlier, the, um, the calcium, the, the minerals that are inside of the bones leach out into the liquid. So whether or not you have a child or, or are lactating, or maybe you're just a regular person, you know, not, ain't got nothing creation-y going on right now. Um, if, you drink, if you drink a bone broth, it'll benefit your bones personally and your teeth. Um, it can help. Um, when it comes to like processing vitamin D, you do need calcium and magnesium in, and phosphorus in order to help with that process. And bones are rich in that. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps with, with, um, with opt, optimal usage of vitamin D and optimal uh, calcium absorption. Um, How often do you drink it? it? Say again? How often do you drink it? Well, I mean, if you're asking me personally, I mean, I, I like a lot of bone broth, so I've been eating this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're asking like how often should you drink it as much as you want mm -hmm. but if you're using um i mean it is low in fat actually because um i mean once you once you peel the skin off and defleshing you're, you're there's not much fat actually on the on the head of a sheep or on the, the actual bones and joints i mean if you're using like a shoulder bone you know um, there might be some fat on it, but still not that much. I mean, you can let your bone broth get cold and then what little cholesterol is floating at the top, you can just scrape that off, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it's, it is pretty healthy. It doesn't, it's not bad to have all the time. I mean, but if you want to have it every single day, I'd say you're pregnant. <laughs> ain't nobody else is going to drink it every single day unless they're pregnant and craving it. Where can people find recipes? We have a question. Recipes, please. Oh, well, um, my recipes come from uh, what I learned growing up from my grandmother and whatnot and by my, my family. So, I mean, you can ask people like me or other tribal members who eat sheep, you know, like for their recipes. I mean... Basically, whatever I would say to eat these to different types of bone soup. I mean, the one I made is a base. Basically, you can do a lot with it already. You can put tomatoes in it. You can put chilies. I mean, it's a base. Hey, yes, like that. The yes, exactly what uh, Ramona is saying. It's it's a you you do whatever you want with it. You know, edit it the way you want. Add some herbs. You want some rosemary? Throw some rosemary in it. You know, and it also depends on what you're using to make the broth. So if you're using fish, I mean, I mean, if you want to make a creamy, creamy, like using fish heads, salmon heads, some people make creamy salmon head soup, you know, and that's a bone broth. You know, some people make a, you know, if you want to boil some chicken bones, you know, that's a bone broth. I mean, you can make a, some sort of chicken soup with it. I mean, this one I have right here is just um, an example of like using, using sheep bones. Because I don't know, I have a love affair with eating bones. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like like for, for recipes, ask people, type Google. 
add add real whipped cream to fish broth and herbs. Yeah, yeah, you can you can make a, a creamy creamy soup like that. It's good. So we were talking just uh, in the pre-show before your class began, and we were talking about how do you even get a sheep's head, and you had some really good advice. Do you mind sharing it with the class? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, if you're like in a city, because I'm that's where I am, basically. I, I don't have any sheep. You know, I'm in an apartment. Um, so you go to the butcher, and you can tell them, you can ask them, hey, do you got any bones, or you got any, any heads, you know, laying around? you know, from today, because what they usually do is, like, they'll get, like, beef, you know, whole cuts of beef, whole sides of beef, and, you know, they'll deflesh them and then sell the steaks and whatnot, but where's all the bones? So you can ask them, hey, you know, you got any bones? If they don't have any, can you, you can tell them, hey, can you just reserve me some bones, and then I'll come and I'll buy them from you tomorrow, or, you know, whenever. Um, so basically, just be friendly with your butcher. And just ask them, ask them for some bones, because usually they are commonly considered trash, you know, trash foods, you know, like they usually feed them to animal shelters or they throw them away. They don't think that they're their actual food, which is funny because historically every culture eats them. <laughs> it's just uh, I want to blame chalk that up to commercialization, people, people being taught that only certain things and only certain cuts are edible. So mm -hmm. just talk to your butcher, talk to your fishmonger. If you got fish, fish people who like, like seafood markets. Um, what did I do? One time when I was in the States, I was living in Virginia. There was a, there was a grocery store. Um, I forgot what it was called, but they have a seafood section, right? So I went to them and I asked them, I said, Hey, you got fish heads? And they, I, I was really, really serious. I was like, you got fish heads? And they were just looking at me like, huh? I was like, you got fish heads. I was like, let me get some. And they were like, well, we we, we, th we throw them all away already. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna come tomorrow and I want some fish heads, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, uh, I said, like, you sell them to me? And they were like, we'll just give them to you. I was like, okay. And that was it, I went to them. <laughs> your regular seafood section of your, your grocery store, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important because one of the things that one of our other instructors, I think you dialed in on his call, um, Sid, we were talking about access and a lot of folks that come into this class are, we're all urban natives, right? So we don't know how to get sheep's head, but now I do because thank you to this class and thank you to you. Mm -hmm. Now I know, um, especially I think with beef, I'm wondering if consuming beef broth like prior to your monthly can help with iron. That's something that I struggle with is iron. Oh yes, bone marrow, because bone marrow has that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for that tip. That's a really helpful one. I, I don't know why I didn't just think, oh, we could go to the butcher, but I guess you just make nice at the butcher, you know? So. <laughs> Does anyone else have questions? We've got a number of people on our class. Um, we also have Ramona who says, I make a chicken on fire. every week <laughs> and get bones from Love Chicken Grower. Oh, maybe from a local chicken grower. She also mm. says, use coconut milk instead of dairy, you know, if that's a thing that you need mm. to consider, or add real whipped cream to fish broth mm. and herbs. Those are some good. Okay, so let me talk about dairy right quick. So, because I'm a, I'm a, I can't really have dairy. So what I do is, if I wanted to thicken up my my stew, like I'll, I'll, I'll make a small pot of it, and um, I usually put either corn flour in it that's really grinds fine, grounds fine, or um, if I have acorn flour or even chestnuts, I like smush up the chestnuts into like a like a paste, and I'll just add it to it to kind of thicken up the the sauce because uh, dairy is not my friend, <laughs> but it tastes good, but I can't have it. <laughs> so I just use um, whatever gluten-free kind of flour that's there, like amaranth flour, chickpea flour, bean flour, corn flour, that's the most common one I use. Yeah, so I definitely feel you on the, like the dairy. I definitely feel you on the dairy because dairy causes me to have asthma. 
um, mm. and really bad inflammation in my sinuses. This is awful. But I just wanted to hand over the mic to Monique because she's been asking several questions and I want to make sure that her questions are uh, answered. And she also has made some cool comments about salmon chowder and things like that. <laughs> I don't know if Monique, yeah, you're hi. able to unmute yourself at this point. I did, did I? Okay. Can you hear me? Lovely. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I live up in Northern California um, on the Yurok Reservation. And so they do a lot of salmon, um, salmon fishing. And I got kind of famous um, making, and you're always trying to look for different salmon recipes because you're eating salmon morning, noon, and you know, night uh, often for long periods of time. So um, I made the salmon chowder with coconut milk mm -hmm. and I add fresh corn, red bell pepper, you know, onion, garlic, and that's it. And because of the coconut milk, you don't have to add anything thicker or anything to it. And, um, mm -hmm. but my, my secret is um, because we can salmon. So one can of fresh salmon and one can of smoked salmon. Mm -hmm. And it's killer. Like people show up to my events with their own mason jars, you know, to take it home. But I don't do dairy. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, and it's really healthy. And I don't even tell anybody that it's coconut milk. I mean, they have no idea. Um, but so that's like the one thing that I do is I make my pasta with coconut milk. Mm. I do all my baking with coconut milk. Um, if it's water, then I use coconut water. I don't add, use any sugars because the coconut mm. water is just full of sweet. Um, so like for smoothies or brownies or pancakes, it's all coconut water and or coconut milk. Yum. Mm. Interesting thing about coconut water is that back in like World War II, the the marine corps was using well the military in general was using um uh coconut water as um kind of like a like an iv fluid for for yeah. marines and sailors and stuff that were out on the islands so coconut water is very very similar to to plasma or to iv fluids. They, um they actually in zoos they feed um coconut water coconut milk to the baby animals that they have to hand feed mm -hmm. How did you learn that, Monique? Out of necessity? Uh, well, I just experimenting, experimenting because I, I would, I love salmon, you know, chowder and, um, and I would phlegm up, I'd get headaches and stomach aches. Mm. So I just experimented and said it's a, it's a, it's a thing now people make for ceremonies. So I'm like mm -hmm. really honored that it, it, it really took hold, you know, especially the coconut milk part. And somebody even made um, eel chowder one time with some coconut milk in it. So, yeah. And especially like, even if you're doing like um, fish head soup or just fish bone soup, it works for anything, but especially for like pastas, like I make a, um, um, what do they call it? Um, pasta and noodles, you know, the, for the kids, a mac and cheese mm -hmm. with coconut milk because it's thick, mm -hmm. it's white. And you could add, like I add yeast, I don't add any, there's no dairy and no, um, cheese in my, no milk or cheese in my, um, my noodles for the kids and they really love it. Oh, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, also, Monique, you had a question regards to haze, uh, witch hazel, I believe. Yeah, um, can you, instead of using the alcohol or the glycerin, can you soak your herbs in the witch hazel for a tincture? No. It's interesting. No, because it's a, it's a, it has its own constituents going on with it. It's too, um, it's too astringent. It's too drying. It's um, okay. So the alcohol, when you're when you're extracting the constituents of an herb with alcohol or glycerol or gl glycerin, I should say, um, it, it pulls out the cons the, it breaks down the cell walls and pulls it out. And I mean, witch hazel will do that too. But it has, it's a sorry, there's a fly. Um, it has um. It has its own constituents that can actually uh, cause problems if you take it in internally like that. Um, you can't like like you're talking about the clear witch hazel like you get in the bottle at the store, right? That's no no. Use it outside. Don't use it inside. <laughs> you get sick. They got witch hazel capsules that is not the the witch hazel liquid that you get in the bottle. That's processed a different way. Mm-hmm. And what's in the capsules is the plant material, hey?
All right. Well, we have uh, other questions. Yeah, I just got about 15 more minutes here. Well, if you didn't want to make a tincture with either with vodka or with glycerol, but but you want to make it with another sort of beverage, you can make it you can make it using like um, red wine or white wine. That would be a tonic wine. That's what it would turn into. And then the dosage for that would be a little stronger. So I wouldn't recommend taking it while pregnant or at least not taking it often while pregnant because it's usually like one sherry glass of a dose for a tonic wine. So I, I wouldn't recommend that when pregnant. But I mean, to be honest, um, if there was a way of using a different type of, you know what, instead of a tincture or a tonic wine, you could just ferment an herb if you wanted to, to, it'll have like therapeutic doses of natural alcohol in it because when you ferment, for example, if you're gonna ferment hibiscus or, or chamomile, um, you would make it into a tea and add some sugar and then let it let it naturally ferment, put the cap on it and let it let it go. After a couple of days, it, it will be um, kind of like a soda. Well, for me, it's a couple of days. It's hot where I'm at, it's, desert, it's the desert. Um, it could be like a soda and it would have therapeutic amounts of alcohol in it and it would still extract constituents. So I would say that's another way of of taking it instead of a tincture or a wine. Now, do you, would you shake that every day like you would a tincture? Oh, definitely not. If you're trying to ferment something, you know, because it's gonna release carbon dioxide in the fermentation process, it'll be like a soda. So, I mean, oh. if, you, if you shake a bottle of soda, it's gonna, you know, get everywhere. <laughs> okay. Like, don't, no shakies, no shakies. <laughs> I'll leave it be. It will, it, will, it will mix itself, I think, because when the air bubbles are, when the bubbles are being released, it, there's actually some movement going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fermentation process breaks down breaks down the plants and it releases releases the constituents. So, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question. Mm -hmm. Do tinctures go bad? Like, how long are they good for? Should we have seasonal um, ones? Like, how long? Do they go bad if they're in alcohol? Um, no, is it sterile? I would say it would be good for like a year or two. Here's the thing. I've heard I've heard some herbalists say that tinctures will be good for up to five years. I've had herbalists say no after no, replace it after a year or two years. I would say um, if you're not using it very often, replace it after two years. Um, just because I, I believe anyway that the constituents of the plants, um, they're sitting in alcohol. So eventually alcohol is good. It's a chemical. Alcohol is, even though it's a natural chemical, it's a chemical. So um, alcohol might degrade some, some constituents in a plant. I mean, okay, in modern science, we don't know still how many constituents are exactly inside of a one plant. They are still analyzing things. So they, you know, and some constituents, some things that are in plants, um, modern science says that they don't know what it does, but they know that it's in a plant, you know? So we don't know for sure, scientifically anyway, if some of these inert or not active constituents, if they are activated in some sort of way um, in a tincture, which adds to its homeopathic benefit. But we do know some of them will degrade either, either in hot water or after a period of time or with alcohol. So, I mean, there's some constituents that will be considered inert, but they might have therapeutic value, but we just don't know yet scientifically. So I would say after one year or two years, change, you know, change your tincture because maybe some of those constituents that we, we don't know enough about yet, maybe they're actually helpful, but they've reached their half-life, so they've already started to degrade. I mean, then you have some people, they think that you take your, keep your tincture for like five years, it's okay because of the alcohol, and that it's okay if these, these, uh, these variable constituents degrade because, I mean, they're considered inert anyway. But I don't know. I'm of the I'm of the opinion that there's there's reasons why there's 
so many things in plants that we don't even know what they're used for yet. So there's got to be a reason for it. And if 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 they go, if those specific inert ingredients go bad, maybe there was a benefit that we don't know. Maybe there's a chemical reaction from that that constituent in the body somehow um, that adds to to its medicinal property. So I, I would say after one year or two year, change your tincture. And how should you label? Like, how do you label your tinctures? Because like, I just have mine on a piece of paper, but if I were to ever lose my little record book, I would be like, in, in a serious way. <laughs> I wouldn't know when things were. Uh, put, a marker, put, a, put, a, put a sticker with a, on a permanent marker. You write uh, the date that you, made, that you first mixed it together, um, what the plants were that you used, how much of each. Um, you write that all on the, on the label on the side. And then, you know, you, you mix it, you know, then once after, after it reaches like four weeks or six weeks, you can write on the side, you know, it hit four weeks on this date or whatever. And then, then, you know, okay, from that time period on, I can use it. I mean, you can write, you can pre-write your expiration date if you want, oh, throw away or get rid of, you know, after one year or two years or five years or whatever. It's very simple. Like labeling a, a Ziploc bag for the fridge. You just write when you did it and what's in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Putting it on a piece of paper, I mean, it's going to it's gonna get lost. I mean, if I know yeah, me, it's going to get lost. If it's on a piece of paper, it's done. Definitely <laughs> don't do what I do <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I just wanted to make a, a comment that I'm really happy to have this class and have you here because there's a lot of information for me, that's coming out about micro and, and macronutrients, essentially, and getting all these these things that you need from plants and bone broth. And I remember when I was pregnant, I I didn't have morning sickness. I had day sickness, day, night, afternoon, dust, dawn. Mm -hmm. It was awful. And they kept giving me prenatal vitamins, and I must have went through about 10 different brands. And mm -hmm. every single brand made me gag and have like a, a vomiting feeling for like hours on end. So eventually I just didn't take any prenatal vitamins at all. And I wish that um, especially urban natives, we had more of this knowledge out there so we can take, kind of get away from, you know, like you called it the, the allopathic side of things and go more towards the natural, especially when we're like suffering in weird ways and stuff like that. And um, I just want to thank you for having this type of knowledge to being presented out there because I know that there's so many native moms, especially with like, um, I remember talking to one of my friends from Canada, especially from the stolen generations that they don't have like a connection back to their grandmothers and their mothers. And so when they were having their children, it was really hard. And like simple things like, well, how do you deal with, you know, how do you deal with, you know, nausea and, and all this stuff naturally and and taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank you because these discussions really need to be had, especially for our relatives who are like, you know, either from the stolen generations or living in cities or estranged or or just mm -hmm. might not have the cultural knowledge because it got taken away through colonization. And I think this is a really important part of food sovereignty because it's dealing, you know, our, our bodies, like you said, we're, we have creator medicine and our bodies need things to go and create life and stuff like that. I just want to thank you. And if you have any comments regarding that. I have a comment regarding creation energy. So when I, what, the way I was taught, um, the interesting thing about me is that um, the way I was raised, I was raised by a, a family that became Christian, you know, so they were all um, um, like, I know how to be Apache in there according to like how I cook or things I things I wear or things I do and I know a lot of words for food stuff foods basically food stuff ingredient stuff but I don't know I'm not fluent in the language to speak I don't know our our spirituality I don't because I everybody became Christian everybody became Catholic you know they got pictures of like you know the Catholic church in, in White River or whatever you know so it's like I didn't I, I'm I'm second generation off the res so it's like my mother had nothing to do with the res. I didn't. 
I, I, I grew up with my grandmother. My grandmother uh, was raised more mescalero from in, with her family in New Mexico. So uh, there's a lot of things that are different with, with, for example, with White Mountain that's different from mescalero. And uh, I have, I'm learning that now. And the great thing about the internet and having a community is that you can learn, okay, I've always said things like this, or I've always done things like that. And then they say, oh, that's mezcal. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's mezcal. Okay, so th then there's this stuff and that stuff. And I'll say, yes, that's white mountain. And I'll be like, okay, so I'm grow I grew up with both, but being second generation off a of res and I don't have that sort of um, strong connection. Uh, well, much of, I just know my family, you know, uh, as far as stories go, spirituality. So it's important and why I brought up in the, the class is that seek out, seek out these knowledgeable people for your people because there has to be, I mean, if you grew up urban native or otherwise, you know, disassociated from your spirituality um, because, because of Christian colonization, um, reach out to your communities, to people from your communities or, you know, and, and ask them, hey, so I'm trying to, to make this connect connection with my, my child before she's born. You know, what am I supposed to eat? What am I supposed to not eat? You know, how am I supposed to, what am I supposed to teach her as soon as she comes out? Like if, as soon as she comes out, is there something I got to put in her mouth? You know, is there something I have to do with her, with her, with her placenta or a bill cord? you know, stuff like this and get that knowledge because otherwise bare basics, I only know, Okay, we have creation energy. When you have the baby, not just anybody can touch that child because the child has creation energy and people can have bad intent to, to, to take some of that energy for themselves. Or even when you're pregnant, people wanna bless themselves with you because, because of your creation energy. So like, so like, don't let anybody just touch you or, or touch your child or, you know, I, I, these are the basic things I did know, but like deeper things, no, I didn't know. Like, I, I know not to cut my child's hair until she's like four or like eight or seven or something like this, but, but, but there's a reason for why, I don't know. I have to ask, you know, I have to learn this stuff that being second generation off a of res, I don't know. And it's, it's it, the stuff I did know about how to live has been, it's been helpful. Um, because I'm all by myself and I had my daughter by myself. No, no family, no, no anyone around me in, in, this, in this place. So, you know, I, I knew how to feed her um, when, when I was pregnant, like I'm gonna eat Apache food because I'm pregnant and this is what I want my child to eat when I'm pregnant. You know, I, this is important for me. She's gonna eat her culture while she's in me. So I knew how to do that, but I can't imagine uh, like how it would be for somebody who who doesn't even have that, you know? Like they don't even know when they're pregnant, how to feed their child that connection when they're pregnant, you know, for their people. So you should like reach out if you can, or if you if you even hear that there's somebody, somebody who is a, I wanna say ethnically cleansed, but like a totally urban native, they don't know nothing. And you know, they're pregnant and they're, they don't know nothing. Then volunteer to just tell them, hey, so did you do like this or like that? Or did you eat like this or like that? Or you know, you know, it's the it's the winter. So in the winter, you you should do like this and like that. Did you do it? You know. And then if they say no, I don't know, then take that time to volunteer this knowledge to to help build your community or help this community member. Because you know the internet's great. Look at us using it right now. You know to to help share that knowledge and preserve it, pass it on. I hope I made sense. I'm, I might be talking all over the place. I'm tired. <laughs> no, I think you're making really good sense and you're bringing up a really good point because one of the things I've noticed a lot with a lot of the mother's networks that I've been in is that a lot of the moms, and this is cross continent. It's not even just in the USA. We're talking about in Mexico, Canada, the islands, South America, a, a lot of indigenous people or mothers who have been um you know kind of like you use the word ethnically cleansed or pushed away mm -hmm. from their communities or their communities are in shambles because one thing i think that a lot of people don't understand is that every nation has its own degree of assimilation forced assimilation mm -hmm. its own degree of genocide 
And with that comes the abandonment of mothers, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think it's so important that you said reach out because so many Native moms, and I don't care if they're young, if they're, they're, you know, whatever the situation is, don't pass your judgments. You know, being pregnant is a very vulnerable time. It's a very sacred time and it's actually ceremonial, you know? And I don't know for you, Phoenix, but for me, like I really understood life and death literally in one moment. Um, and it's, it was more of a, not like a, I can't cognitively explain that type of ceremony or that, that, that thing that we go through, but that barrier of being in between worlds, but, um, mm -hmm. reaching out, I think is really important. Create support systems for mothers, uh, you know, indigenous mothers, because there's so many of them out there, whether they got lost to the foster care system mm -hmm. or the stolen generations, or just at their culture, like uh, in my mm -hmm. community, the, primarily the caciques and the bejiques were the first to be killed. Um, the Span and then the Spanish came in and purposely put in Catholicism. So like you were predominantly Catholic uh, upbringing because of all the eradication and murdering of the healers and the mm -hmm. traditional peoples that held that knowledge. So understanding that and kind of having an open heart in these spaces and saying, okay, my relative, or even if they're from a different nation, they're pregnant, reach out and give that support. That's such a, a beautiful thing and important thing that I think is not talked about enough in spaces. You pointed that out that people, and, and I really think that like people, you should, if you know something and you know that you know something that someone else doesn't know, and you know that you're both from the same, the same tribe, the same community, then, and you know this stuff, just volunteer to give it, give it to your community member. You know, maybe they don't know everything about it. My own sisters, I got sisters, my sisters, okay, my family like were scattered, you know, I got sisters that went to the, the foster, foster system with other different family members and then me with my grandmother. Um, but I got sisters that grew up on the res and I didn't know that from my grandmother, I learned certain things. They grew up on a res, they, they, they didn't learn like a lot of things that I learned from being far away from it. So then I talked to her and I say, no, 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 you know, you're pregnant right now, or you just, oh, what was it? She, she just had a baby. She had the baby and you know, some weird stuff was happening in the house. And I told her she got to pray and she got to bless the house and whatnot. I said, because remember the creation energy. And then I talked to her about it and she was like, yeah, I remember hearing something about it. And I was like, I'm the one, because like you said, there's a degree of assimilation or, or there's a, a, great, a degree of internalized colonialism on, on you know, in, in our homelands, basically. And, you know, I saw it with my sister because, you know, they, for a long time, they were like, we grew up on a res, you didn't. So you don't have that connection with the land. So you're a stranger, you know? And then they, they don't want to talk to me. They don't want to have anything, you know, they're like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're the foreigner, you know what I mean? But then, but then I find out that, hey, you know, my sister's going through this stuff and I can give her this knowledge that she apparently somehow didn't get either from the family or what, I don't know what the story is with that, but she didn't get that knowledge. So then I give it to her and I say, just pray and you, you know, I, I can't tell you the steps for prayer, but I know you need to pray for that. And I, you know, you go find you a medicine person to help you bless your house if you don't know how to do it. Like I told her like this because you know, the creation energy and the baby, maybe something is coming to your house, something, in, you know, an invisible person or something. And they're trying to, you know, take your kid, your son's energy, he's a baby. And then she's like, oh, you know what? Maybe, and then she's like, yeah, okay. I'll ask, I'll look for a medicine person, you know? And I was just like, you didn't know about these things? And she's like, no. And I said, okay, do not tell me next time that I'm the foreigner. I have nothing to do with this. I don't know nothing, okay? We all know something. We all know th th things that it, we know. What did I say? We all know things that the other person doesn't know, regardless of where they grew up. So we share it with each other. Don't don't try to act high and mighty or patronizing or condescending over where somebody is from or where did they grow up versus you. I mean, even your own siblings. You're gonna say one sibling, you know, grew, grew up on the res, but you didn't. So there should be a difference. No, you should, don't do that. Just recognize it for what it is. Everybody's got their own stories of why and how they got to where they are. Just, just recognize if you know something and the other one doesn't, share it. 
And if this person knows something that you don't know, let her ask her to share it if she doesn't volunteer it. You know what I mean? So be, be helpful with the community like this. And as you said, maybe there's other natives who are in the urban setting um, and they absolutely don't know anything at all. And you, you accept, except they might just know what tribe they came from. That's it. What tribe is in their lineage, that's it. So talk to them and be like, hey, uh, you know, I heard your people do like this and like that. And you know, maybe I know I have a friend who's from the same people as you. So maybe you should talk to her. You know what I mean? Be helpful like this, mm -hmm. build a community, be constructive, share medicine, share, share knowledge, support each other. You know, we already got basically the world against us. We don't need to be against each other. Oh, okay. So I'm yeah, reached. And those are, that's actually a really beautiful note to wrap up our class on. Um, thank you so much, Phoenix, for coming yet again to just share your really big brain with us. You know so much. Brooke and I were talking, we're just like, she's such a wealth of knowledge. Oh my God. <laughs> so um, yeah, just thank you for coming. And um, Brooke, did you want to close us out? Um, just thank everybody for coming again, as usual, to First Foods. We're now on Wednesday night, same time. Next week, we're going to be having Rayanne Medicine, and she's going to be talking about breast care and lactation. So I'm excited for that also. And so hopefully you guys can join us for that too. And um, yeah, just thank you for coming. All right. Bye, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Thank you for coming. Bye, take care.